I'm Nora Ali. Really quickly on myself, I'm not important right now, but I am a, t a business news anchor at Cheddar, which is a post-cable news network, which coincidentally was acquired by a cable company. Uh, we focus on uh, markets, tech, business, news. Our main set is on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Prior to that, though, I was a product manager at Jet.com. I joined it, e-commerce company, joined it prior to its launch, prior to its acquisition by Walmart, a $3.5 billion acquisition. Don't worry, I am not rich because of that, but here we are now. So Amir, very excited to be with you here today. I want to talk context of your business in the yep. center of cloud, AI, data. A lot of fun buzzwords, but mm -hmm. it was first founded in 2004, launched out of stealth and saying, where are we now in cloud, data, and AI versus where maybe we were in the early 2000s? All right, Let's, maybe this makes all the noise. So, where well, should I make an introduction? Introduce myself or no? You can, yeah, sure. All right, quick uh, introduction Amir Orad, Sysense Chief Exec. Um, most important for this room, it's my third startup. I was a co-founder of one, joined the other one early on, became a CEO. First one was sold 450 mil to RSA Security. Second one became Actimize, $200 million revenue, 1,000 employees. Third one, Sysense, I joined early on at like just below 10 mil revenue. We're way over $100 million ARR now, will be 1,000 employees this year. All of them headquartered in New York City, all of them selling enterprise software. All of them were bloody difficult to build, okay? Sysense is um, an overnight success that started 15 years ago. <laughs> like all startups, that's usually how it works. And what we do for a living, and then we'll connect the dots here, what we do for a living is help people build analytical applications, BI applications, and embed them in their products or their businesses. So for context, we, are the, we just announced today UiPath, the fastest growing software company in the enterprise space, has embedded Sysense in all of its products um, announced today. But other customers include from Tyndall and Unity and Eurelic to Adobe, all the way to GE, Philips, Nasdaq, Nissan, Mazda, uh, Rolls-Royce, and Air Canada, right? Uh, mostly mid-sized companies and very large enterprises, headquartered in New York, very global by now, and that's my introduction. That's an amazing introduction. Let's go back to the space now. Cloud, yes. AI, data. A huge difference between obviously 2004 and 2020. Where would you say we are kind of in that ecosystem? Even in the last five years, everything is different. Everything is different. Five years ago, Hadoop, remember Hadoop? <laughs> it was like a big thing. <laughs> now it's Snowflake, which did not exist five years ago. It's a $12 billion market cap company today. Tableau five years ago was small. It was sold for over $12 billion to Salesforce, which now has on-premise technology. The cloud, no software company, no software on-premise company now has on-premise. So the lines are, lines are blurring between on-premise and cloud, between big data, da bases to data warehouses, to storage, machine learning, AI becoming mainstream, commoditized. You can use a service online to do visual recognition or machine learning with one API command line. Um, so it is a very different space and it's accelerating quickly to the point that we are now disrupting the disruptors of a few years ago. We're replacing tableaus, which until five, six years ago were a startup. So um, that's the space. And what's interesting about it, all of us as consumers use better analytics and AI than the best businesses in the country. We have personal assistance. Waze can tell us that in the future there will be a car accident on the way home and to leave earlier. Netflix can tell us what to watch and when and will we like it. And this is better technology than the best B2B companies in the country. What's cool about your business is you're trying to, in the words of your own company, trying to democratize the use of data. Yep. Describe a little bit just the user experience of using SciSense, the kind of drag sure. and drop ability to do analytics on really big, large uh, sets of data. So our entire focus is how to simplify really complex data sets. And it's not easy. Because you need the end user experience to be really easy. We have doctors, nurses, technicians using it as the end users, but we have what we call the builders, the shadow IT, the BI team, the data team, the product team that need really advanced capabilities, hundreds of APIs, native cloud, microservices, machine learning, Python, R, and balancing the two is bloody difficult. Some companies like Tableau are really easy to use, but they don't have the power. Some like MicroStrategy are really powerful, but don't have the ease of use. Balancing the two is really difficult. If you can do it in any space, 
the sky's the limit. If you can bridge that gap between power and ease, in my view, in any business, there's a lot to do there. You have a really broad scope of the types of companies that use yep. your technology. At what point in the life cycle of a company is it the right time to decide you do want to use a data analytics platform like SciSense? So if I divide the business into two large enterprises and then people selling to enterprises like UiPath or um, other companies, we find that once a startup has product market fit, you finish wandering the desert, you found your uh, true calling, you got the first few deals, first few clients, you're starting to think about almost re-architecting the product to the next level, enterprise grade, in scale, and then you need the best visualization, the best analytics, the best robustness, uh, concurrency, deployment methods. That's when we typically work with early stage companies. And the large enterprises, it's very simple. All the legacy stuff breaks down in every company right now. It's, it's actually frightening. Everything breaks. Either they're going through cloud replatforming, and all the old technology is not cloud ready, so if you have to put new technology, or um, the whole digital transformation, and again, all the old technology is not usable. Those companies wait a month when the CEO asks a question, and a bunch of IT people and DBAs work behind the scenes to give him the answer. That makes no sense, right? So in those two moments, the large companies say, enough is enough, we have to modernize, or we will lose our business. Example, um, Netflix is very capable with data. Sony and HBO raised their hand and said, we have to get help, and started using license. But it wasn't until Netflix made their life very difficult that they had to go and build more than data teams to do that. There are a lot of ambitious product teams out there who are having this debate every single day. Do we build analytics capabilities in-house or do we outsource it to the experts? Sometimes developers can be very confident in themselves. They say, well, I can build a very good system um, that's better than anything that's out there and funded by VC. Mm -hmm. How do you make that pitch to product leaders, to developers, to designers even, who insist that they would like to build something in-house when it comes to analytics? They should build it on a platform, right? We all use JavaScript or Python. We don't write assembly, <laughs> I, I hope. And we all use cloud services, AWS and the like. We don't build our own data centers. So you can build on a platform, but it has to be builder-oriented. And we spend endless efforts in making builder-oriented. For example, people who build technology hate being sold to. They want to go and try it themselves. They love APIs, but they don't want the salesperson to talk about APIs. It's weird, right? So they just want to play with the APIs. Sandboxing, trials. So you have to build technology that caters to people who build on top and still get the ease of use for those who know nothing about technology. And that's the balance. There's also this concept of choosing a platform because it's a part of a suite of products that you already use mm -hmm. versus a one-off service. One example that comes to mind is for workplace messaging. A lot of companies will end up using Microsoft Teams because they're already on Azure. It's just easier versus using Slack, and that's a bit of a headwind for Slack. How do you convince companies that maybe it is better to go with this one-off service that doesn't necessarily provide the suite of other tools for you? So there's, a, there's two questions in that question. Right now, there's a massive cloud war going on right now. It, it's amazing to see, and just case in point, I was in Seattle last week meeting the execs of both cloud companies I should not name out of Seattle. And I'm sorry I said Azure inside this. I, I did not, by the way. AWS. Um, <laughs> okay, I said it twice now. All right. And what the businesses really want, especially enterprises, they don't want to be stuck with technology they cannot move and migrate over time. So having cloud neutrality, and we are a very large AWS partner and love the partnership, um, all the way to meeting Andy Jesse at you know, the, uh, the, the last event. But being able to move the Sysense workloads from every cloud company to another, if needed, is a major competitive edge. Um, even worse, with geopolitics right now, people actually believe it will be the Chinese cloud, the Russian cloud, the European cloud, maybe the UK cloud, because we're not in Europe anymore. Um, and I'm, I'm serious, the actual discussions. So having the ability to be not locked down to one ecosystem is a competitive differentiator. Snowflake, which is very similar to Sysense, cross-cloud analytics, we do the data side, we do the analytics, is really playing hard on that point. People don't want to get stuck in one cloud in critical technology. Other areas, they mind less because it's easy to move. This is deep technology, AI, machine learning, visualization, storage, processing. Uh, so that's, that's on that front. 
And then best of breed, you know, is a blessing and a curse. You get the best average product at the best average price with the best average experience. And it's sometimes okay, and that's good enough. Sometimes it's not. Every company now has to be data-driven. doesn't matter what industry, doesn't matter what size, but there's so much more scrutiny now on data privacy and just awareness from the consumer perspective on how companies are using data, impending regulation, probably from the U.S. We saw CCPA go into effect in California. Does that worry you at all about how companies will be able to use data when there is regulation that comes out of the U.S.? I'm a big believer that if you will not be data-driven, you'll be out of business. And it's so extreme. I was yesterday in Miami meeting a customer, mid-sized company, a few 200 employees. They built technology for addiction centers to help them help uh, people with food disorder and alcoholism fight addiction. And we use analytics and very advanced analytics with Sysense to help optimize the quality of care, right? We have from Salvation Army to the DOD, using, which is a weird combination, using Sysense. Um, everyone has to be data-driven. We allow people to keep the data in their own cloud or in our cloud. It's totally up to them, so I think that flexibility is really valuable. We have HIPAA, ISO, PCI, and every other acronym you can imagine. Um, Europeans are more strict than California, so it's, they're actually starting there. But you don't have an option. If you will not deploy analytics, machine learning, AI down the road, you'll be less competitive, you'll be more expensive to run the business, you'll provide less quality of service, you'll be out of business. So I think the train left the station a long time ago. Now it's how we ride the train, do we ride, not do we ride the train. And going back to the democratization of data, you no longer have to know SQL or R or even know what those things are to be smart uh, right. at data analysis overall. How do you think that's going to impact just entrepreneurship and the types of maybe non-technical people now then that can start businesses in a vast array of different industries now? Look, it's just like the cloud. All of us are now building massive data sets and, and processing power without a single machine. How many of you had to buy a big closet and put a lot of stuff in it and an AC? This is moving all the time. <laughs> um, we don't do that anymore. The same is with analytics. You can run amazing visual recognition, forecasting technology, etc., in half a day of scripting on a cloud uh, service. That's amazing. So you can focus on product market fit, UX, go to market, and leave all of this hard stuff to someone else. At the same time, we work with what we call data teams, data engineers, data scientists, and more and more companies now deploy them for the really advanced stuff. Because even if it takes half a day, you need to know what you want to achieve. You need to know what questions to ask. You need to know what technology to dream about to then use. Um, and business people are not good at dreaming about machine learning algorithms to improve their demand generation. We don't have the skill set. I want to talk about company dynamics a little bit. You've said in a past interview that valuation is a milestone, but shouldn't be cause for celebration. Sysense yep. recently hitting that unicorn status. Until recently, it was something that a lot of companies celebrated, but recently we've been seeing the downfall, for lack of a better word, of very high-profile decacorns like WeWork, for example. Do you think the focus now for startups and for uh, long-existing companies, the focus is going to be on achieving profitability faster now versus kind of celebrating those unicorn, decacorn, whatever comes after that, corn milestones? Six questions at once. So I'll try and <laughs> let's go one by one. I've raised money in 2000, which is not a good time to raise money. Raised, uh, we had business in 9-11, in 08. We've, I've seen like all of those 19 years of startups, which makes me feel a bit old. But in that process, first of all, raise money when you can, not when you need it. I know it sounds obvious. When you get to a point you don't have money to pay you know, the, the water bill and you don't have water in the office, you've, you appreciate it much more. Uh, second, valuation is really not that significant. Obviously, if it's between $10 million valuation and 100, it's material. But if it's I'll give you an example. You raise 20 mil on 150 mil or 200. Did anyone do the math in Excel? What is the difference in dilution? Do the math. It's insignificant. Do the math. Well, let's do 20 on 200 and 20 on, two, on 240, whatever. Right? One is 10% before the money. One is 9%. 1% dilution difference. Will you sacrifice who you married to for 1% more happiness? <laughs> right? That's like, but you're getting married. <laughs> You're going to have lots of kids, hopefully. That 1% is irrelevant. It's a waste of time to spend another month on the road, give terms, veto rights. It's, it's bullshit. 
It's really immaterial. Now, again, material differences are material. Those are not material differences. People get higher valuation today in weird ways, which will bite them when the economy slows down. Preferences, ratches, vetoes, bad partners that are really rich but know shit about technology and it will blow up one day. I think it's not the right thing to do. And second, um, when we hit the billion dollar plus, half my employees thought we can spend more money. Actually, when you get to that valuation, you need to become more efficient, not spend more money. The money spent, the, the efficiency index has to improve. So the focus on efficiency is getting more critical as you hit scale. So that's not the case. People think we, we achieved some, some success. No, uh, we just reached the next, destina you know, the next uh, station on the journey. And that euphoria can be very dangerous. So it's a balancing act. We're happy, it's, we're proud, it's a good moment, but it's not the goal. We're not going to sacrifice who we marry to to get a nice evaluation. I think many people with nice valuations achieved the wrong way will be really unhappy soon. Maybe two years, maybe one year, maybe three. I don't know the macroeconomy exact trends, but we know how it ends. Um, so that's my view. How does the calculus for when to raise additional funds change if you are, say, starting a company from scratch, like you've done in, in, in the past, versus entering as a CEO? I.e., what did kind of your calculus look like coming into Sisense after yeah. it had existed already for many years? Beggars are not choosers, okay? If you have an idea and someone wants to give you money, <laughs> take the money and run. It's very simple. <laughs> That's, the, that's what you do. And then you go to a basement, to talk to no one, and make shit happen. The, that, that's the goal. If you're a patent entrepreneur and you build some IP and a patent that is you know, amazing, you're in a different bucket, but that's not most people. I had the luxury of entering a company which A, I due diligence, B, I had a plan how to take from amazing to even more amazing, good to great, pick your poison. It was a really good company before I joined, and I helped it go to the next level, and that me joining plus the plan, after a couple of quarters of showing the plan making an impact, allowed us to increase dramatically the valuation and take money before we needed it. And that's a good thing to do, as we just discussed. The last run we did, which happened now in the last couple of months, was purely because of the macroeconomy. I like money in my bank account than someone else's bank account, and I don't know what will happen with the elections, I don't know what will happen with Iran, China, plagues, wars. I have no clue. All I know is money in my bank account is better than anyone else's bank account. And that allows us to continue building a great business. So, do, I mean, do you track these macro factors that are out of your control? But, or I, do you I personally, try to ignore it? I'm a news, you know, uh, I like to read the news like 10 times a day. Yeah. But Watch Cheddar, please. Uh, <laughs> I'll do a better job. Actually, the, the best publication is I read The Economist once a week. That's like, if you... One thing to read, read The Economist, but um, I do track it. It doesn't really change what we do. It did impact the timing of the, the race. And the bigger focus was who, who is going to be in the round and how fast can I do it? Mm. I spent the, we did not have a unique presentation done for this round. We used the old one. Time, time with customers and R&D, much more valuable than time with investors, as much as they will say otherwise. So I, that was the, what we maximized, at the expense of other things. Mm -hmm. But when you think about a potential exit, whatever that means to you, whether it's going public or being acquired by another company, you must have some kind of calculus around how the macro environment is and just appetite for investors in these types True. of companies. So first, an exit is the only time you think about valuation, <laughs> just because that's 100% of the shares, not <laughs> 9 versus 10. Um, and second, depends what you're trying to do. I believe we can build a really impressive company here can be a billion dollar revenue. This market is gigantic. Every company on the planet, if people that do addiction facilities need analytics and the Salvation Army, all the way to GE and Tinder, everyone needs analytics. That's every business out there. And data gets more complex, not less. With more data, not less. With more AI needs, not less. So when you have a big opportunity, go big. Swing for the fences. You know, people on the way will try to stop you, and that's fine. You have to Deal, you know, my, my commitment and my duty is to my investors, employees, and customers. It's not just one or the other. It's all three. That's I want to zoom in a little bit, uh, look a little bit more micro level. Day to day or week to week, month to month, when you're deciding optimization of your services that you offer, mm -hmm. of features, how do you kind of think about A-B testing, 
kind of iterating on existing functionality versus trying to launch something or test something that is quite different from your existing offerings? How do you balance that portfolio? Uh, so it's very different by stage. So anything, I, everything I say now is irrelevant to most of you. <laughs> okay, but I'll talk about right now and then back in the day. Right now, we are trying really hard to create new things that we know may never succeed. And one out of a few succeeds, and it's amazing. But we have the over 2,000 clients and the, the bandwidth to go and try multiple things. Going back 10 years now, um, Sayota, my first business, cybersecurity, using analytics to protect people. Back then, the way you authenticated was either with a password, a very long, annoying password, or the RSA security. How many of you remember RSA security? Numbers moving around? Really? So many? Okay. <laughs> so, well, we'll Really? Where? At Goldman Sachs. Okay, gold, true. <laughs> so all the banks had to do it, but the consumerization of the internet was not practical because security is too difficult and passwords are too easy to hack. So we came up with this amazing idea called risk-based authentication. Anyone knows what it is? You all use it every day. You log into a website, you get a text message saying this is a weird transaction, Here's uh, five numbers to type in. You type them in and you go through. That's my invention 15 years ago. When we invented it, because it was passwords or tokens, both sucked, so we chose this middle ground, everyone told us it's the stupidest idea ever. I went to CISOs. We had Harvard Business School coming over to help us analyze the market. They said it's a stupid idea. Everyone said it's stupid, but we had conviction. And as a startup, when you have conviction, you have to go all in. That's what You cannot A-B test. You have two startups. You don't have you know, time to do one. So we went all in, and for about 12 months, people thought we were idiots, and then became the industry standard, and RSA bought our company, um, and everyone now uses it. You can't A-B test it, right? You, just can't. you have to have conviction. We're in the market. We thought we understand better than others how it will evolve, so we had a foresight, which may be different, um, and we had nothing to lose, which is really great. What's the worst case? Close the company, start another one. Wow. That, that's literally the worst case, right? <laughs> Sounds Anyone? like a lot of work to do that, but... It's called, if you're not ready for that, don't do a startup. Yes, that's very true. Uh, talk to us a little bit more about your customer base. You mentioned Uber, Tinder, a lot of familiar names. Are there certain types of companies that maybe are more inclined to use SciSense than others? Everyone that wants to run with analytics and have complex data challenges. If it's really simple, use Excel, use Tableau, right? There are many options. If it's complex, it's large, it's advanced, it's, you need agility, that's when we come to play. So one of the challenges in a company is go to market. And you may tell me, Amir, you're very defocused. You have car companies and airlines and you have you know, dating companies and, and life-saving uh, hospitals. We're in MRI machines of Philips, for example. Uh, we do have very clear focus. Only companies that want to simplify complex data and build an application on top. So the focus does not have to be a vertical, but you need something that is repetitive. Each and every client has complex data sets, and they need agility and to build an application to run their business or in their product. But if the needs are different depending on the business, do you build one of features for a certain nope. customer? It, so it is I'm, applicable I'm, I'm, across the I'm proud and amazed to say our professional services revenue is less than 5%. We have no customizations. It's a platform for people who can use APIs and plugins and so on to customize it for themselves. This is a real platform. And it, it gives amazing power to people who use it. Uh, this is going to be my last question before we get audience questions. It's kind of existential, so bear with me. You're trying to fix this problem of disparate data within a company, trying to help uh, management employees try to understand user data. My data right now, Facebook has a lot of it, Google has a lot of it, Amazon has a lot of it. Do you imagine a future in our lifetimes where there will be one single source of truth of data for an individual, and that is what businesses across the board are going to tap into? Um, I think it's a really valid utopia that will never happen, um, unless some government will regulate it, and even then it will be only to spy on you, so I doubt it. Um, but if at all the trend is the other way, people used to let you download stuff. Now, in individuals, you can still do that, but they're actually going to limit the access to the data, in my view. 
because of liabilities. If you have an API to download all the data, someone will do that. There's an article this week about the guy that scraped all the images from the internet. Have you seen it? Mm -hmm. And he's doing visual recognition of all of us without our you know, ag agreement. Um, I believe it will be more difficult mm. and less centralized over time because of liabilities and other rules. And you'll need more technologies to help connect the dots because there'll be many dots, not less dots. Add geopolitics. One day California will force you to keep the data in California, not in the US, right? This is getting worse and worse, not better and better. I know, I can, without names, I know of a very large bank, really large, top 10, that is planning for the day we will need to have, we have one global data center, we need to have in every region a copy of the entire technology stuff and data. We're just terrified no one will let them move the data around. So I think it's getting worse before it will get better. Politics, privacy, security um, will make it worse. All right. On that note. Sorry. No, it's, it's all good. All right. Questions from the audience, please. He has so much to say. We have oh, a bunch of hands. Go ahead, this guy in the green sweater. Uh, are you hiring salespeople? <laughs> yes, many. Literally, we have over 100 open sales positions right now. Awesome. Go ahead. What's the biggest challenge you face in terms of managing the business that takes this next Really good question about the challenges. It's a combination of people, everything about people, getting talent, Removing talent, that is the wrong one. Keeping culture when you scale fast. We bought a company, which startups usually don't do. How do you maintain the culture? How do you make sure you no know, assholes are allowed? Because once they come in, it breaks the culture. So that's, that's a big one. It's probably a third of my time. And, with, and it, for example, I just hired a new CFO to understand the Calibre. He was a CFO of very signed public company, Silence, multi-billion dollar company, Alien Vault, multi-billion dollar exit, New Star. How many like that exist in the country? How many in New York? None. So getting, Cali, getting the Cali bear, the highest Cali bear, to New York is difficult. The second one is strategy versus tactics. My personality doesn't make it right or wrong. I believe you need to be able to go all the way down to the details to make sure the things, things continue to work, and then all the way out to the strategy to understand what the heck is going on, well or not well. That balancing act, it's really difficult. And if you're over tilted to one or the other, it can blow up in your face. Those are my personal biggest focus areas. We have a microphone now. Amazing. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm at Conservative. We're a B2B firm focusing in the financial services industry. What would be your best advice going from kind of 20 employees to 100 employees at that phase? Mm -hmm. What, would, what are the, is your best advice uh, from your experience? So my first two companies sold mainly to financial services, so I'm, I hear your pain. Um, selling to banks is really, really painful. It takes too long. Uh, if you get a really big one, it can kill you because they'll choke you. You have a lot of customizations, requirements, and so on. So staying focused and true to the, the goal, knowing it will be a long game, um, and uh, balancing that, get cash in with staying true to your product. That's my number one focus. It's getting a bit better now with uh, fintech. Trump. Banks who will not adopt new technologies will be irrelevant, but it's still it's a long play. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I'm a cybersecurity professional by day and moonlighting in my startup by night, and um, I'm really interested in your background on very successful sales to huge cybersecurity companies. Um, to a cybersecurity startup, what would you say? What's your secret? How do I do what you do? First of all, there's, there's literally no secret. Hard work, amazing people, and good products. It's like, I don't believe in magic. My daughter does, but I, I don't. She also believes in unicorns, by the way. Um, <laughs> it's, it's those three, and you have to be, be ready for it. It's really, really hard. In cyber specifically right now, there's uh, way too many cyber companies, thousands of them. All of them have good, many of them have good technology. No one is going to buy a hundred cyber products. So getting through the noise, I believe, is now more important than anything. And if you cannot do that, don't waste your time. How to do that is magical technology, and we agree there's no magic, or some really unique go-to-market. Some anti-fraud companies broke through the noise by offering insurance. They insured the transaction, so no one took risk, and that was their way to break in. Others do it by, by showing you you've been hacked and 
you show the data before they've never been hacked. I remember demos when the customer literally, the best demos is when they say, stop for a second, I need to go out and talk to my team because I just saw something here. That's like the best demo. Um, and, and that's, you know, you hit a night, you know, you achieved something, but it's really difficult to go th get through the noise. Really difficult. Um, I have a question in terms of your last point about how data is going to be, um, is going to be relegated to like certain regions. Yeah. I read on the news that um, in Europe, uh, certain tech companies are developing data centers mm -hmm. um, in order to um, like track and see if um, the integrity of data. Is that one of the signs to look for in terms of how data is going to be in certain regions and not move? Um, that's, that's the easy. Having an AWS region in Europe is the easy part. Now it's going to be in Switzerland, separate from Russia, separate from Israel, separate from just... Uh, Microsoft just announced one in Israel, separate from the UK. So even Europe is a bunch of uh, geopolitical entities. And, but, but hosting is easy. We need to run your operations there because you have to make local decisions. You have a, need a local IT team, local people who can lo look at the data and analyze it. That's when it becomes really, really painful. The, 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 the hosting part is not the difficult one. We're in the back half of the room, here we go. Yeah, you mentioned um, some end users maybe being doctors and people dealing with uh, data that has high security needs. How do you build the trust of a customer that, let's say, is in the healthcare space and is also looking at Looker that could take advantage of Google security expertise after yep. the acquisition or Tableau with Salesforce is enhancing security posture? How do you build that trust mm -hmm. in companies that are dealing with such sensitive uh, personal information? Excellent question. We have over 20% of our business is healthcare. <clears throat> so GE, Philips, Brunson Hospital, all the way to, uh, you know, heart transplants from ResMed, you run on Sysense. First, we don't have to see the data. That's actually quite appealing, right? When you, we don't need to see the data. Second, if you want us to run it for you, we can run it on AWS, which we prefer, or GCP, or Azure with native technology. Thirdly, we have the PCI and all of the, or the uh, HIPAA compliance you know, expertise needed. And you give references, and that's usually the best way. The challenge with the very large companies you mentioned is that while they have really strong um, regimes, they have zero flexibility. And when you partner with someone to embed them in your product, you will have an oh shit moment. You need to call the, the company and need help to make an ad a change, adapt, you know, last minute. You will not get that from those large companies. They'll have a cookie cutter, a really good, rigid process. And you have to choose what you need. So one thing we focus on is client success, and we measure NPS. How many of you measure a net promoter score? All right, so I highly recommend it. For us, it's the Bible. Our NPS is over 60, 60, which is the highest in the industry, and that's a big differentiator today. Do you want a partner or a vendor, right? And the very large companies have a really, and that's a unique competitive value that startups have. You can be the best partner to someone else. Those large companies cannot. Quick commercial before the next question, because I'm a VC. Uh, anyone who does care about customer success, NPS, look up our local company, Catalyst Software. They <laughs> solve that problem. <laughs> I can hear you. Can you talk about some of the analytic trends that you're seeing your most uh, you know, advanced clients using that maybe aren't mainstream today, but you think maybe companies can be down the road? Sure. The question was about analytic trends. The, while everyone talks about AI, it's a buzzword. 95%, I'm not sure what's the exact number, probably 99, don't use real AI. No one has real AI. Uh, maybe the military, I don't know. No one has real AI. So it's all narrow AI on a good day, or machine learning on a less good day, or a bunch of if-then on a really bad day in scroll cards. <laughs> That's the secret, right? Um, however, I truly see more and more companies using real predictive power. I don't want to call it AI, but machine learning prediction power for recommendation engines uh, and real predictions that change dramatically their business. Dramatically. Like we have examples, people doubled lives being saved just using analytics predictive power. Doubled it, more than 100%. Um, 
healthcare is actually ahead of the market, and some e-commerce companies are really good at that. Um, the average enterprise is way behind, like dramatically behind. And uh, it's an opportunity, right? It's an opportunity. And what happens is what Uber is doing to run their vehicles or Tesla is forcing every car company and every fleet management company to build real predictive analytics. So it's, it's quite amazing how the tech companies take, drag the entire market behind them. Uh, last question. Are you using data to uh, stay ahead of your competition? Uh, Every day. We eat our own dog food. We have many, many dashboards and alerts in the business. The, we use it literally in every department. So from uh, R&D productivity and bug, buy team, burn through, if you know how you clean the bugs, the, obviously demand generation, forecasting, um, looking at backlogs, looking at customer success, churn by cohort, right? We identify the what type of users have the highest likelihood of success and how I can push the business in that direction. Everything we do is doing that. Even basic stuff, we have half the team, half the company have candidates going through really difficult tests to be accepted to the job. Half do not. Who is right? I don't know, but the data can tell you the answer. We canceled half the tests, by the way, as a result. Most teams had zero difference in success for people that came through the test and without the test, right? Some jobs really needed the test. Technical support, SQL stuff. The data is usually better than your gut feeling. Sometimes the gut feeling is better than the data. So you have to know... Um, so I tell everyone, always trust the data until you shouldn't trust the data. <laughs> That's why we have human beings running companies, right? Uh, but uh, mostly the data is correct. Is that Excellent. it? Uh, on that note, let's give a round of applause. Thank you. Cool. We did it. <laughs> thank, thank you so much to Mutiny, to Undefined Labs, Nora for your incredible questions, Amir for keeping it real. Uh, and thank you everyone for coming tonight. Thank you everyone.